I'm Kenneth, your host for tonight. Uh, this evening, we have the pleasure of having Venerable Shi Chuan Guan on PWTN. Venerable Chuan Guan was ordained under Master Miu King or Master Miao Jing in 2002, higher ordination in 2003, and began his monastic training in Fari Monastery, New Mexico, United States. Learning the sutras and practicing meditation under the Mahayana Buddhist tradition, while studying the Theravadan Pali Canon. 2006 to 2009, he continued his training under Venerable Guangsheng in Kongming San Bokaxi Monastery. July 2009 to June 2013, he served in the Buddhist Library as a resident monk. July 2013 onwards, he was resident in uh, Kongming San Bokaxi. Alright, I think we will go on from, uh, to the topic for tonight's conversation. Alright, basically Singaporeans and people living in Singapore okay, have a lot of their materials needs met, yet we are still not very happy with our lives. Okay? This is the way, this is seen in the way we are easily upset over small matters. Uh, what can we do to attain a calm and humane mind even while pursuing all these material needs and do we really have to give up one for the other? Difficulty balancing uh, what we want uh, materially as well as what we want spiritually, and uh, that is always a challenge. And we, we, we are always like on either side of the fence, never really on the fence, you know, really doing the middle part that we should as Buddhists. So tonight's conversation is really, you know, how do we find that middle part? Suggested to them was to do daily practices. 
You see, the thing is that for most people, uh, when we think about spiritual practices, we think about perhaps going to the temple uh, and then joining in for the puja, uh, joining in for the talks, which is good. Yeah? Like this one here. This is not a temple, but. Uh, or sometimes when we feel spiritual enough, we go for a retreat. We disappear for a weekend, or we go away for a week, or two, three, or Like myself, back then I went for a two movies retreat. And I remember how after the first movies retreat, I felt so pumped up, you know? I was like, wow, oh, I want to become a monk. <laughs> but then conditions were not right, so I didn't become a monk. Not immediately anyway. But then when I went back to, to, to home life, went back to work, for about three weeks, oh, every morning we go to you know, do morning puja, drag my mom in the evening, we come and do puja together. That, that lasted about three weeks. After three weeks, back to square. Up. <laughs> so when I shared with uh, some parents in Pokasi, uh, in, the, in the parents' class, and some of them actually tried, uh, I was uh, I was quite impressed, and it's been four months now. Some of them actually wake up at five plus in the morning, uh, do puja, meditation. But this is the thing I told them, I said, uh, do something that you can manage. It's easy to be very pumped up, very energized after a talk or after a retreat, and then think, ah, oh, ah, oh, I must go back, I must read through the whole Pali canon, you know, I must recite. Six syllables, oh my home, like 10 million times in three days. <laughs> you know, I must do this, I must do that. And actually, it's not that difficult to do, really. Not difficult to spend one, two days, or even seven days, or even a month doing intensive practice. Really not difficult. When you are in a retreat, easily do 10, 12 hours of practices. Easily. Like, you have to try not to do. In order not to do 10, 12, you have to really try. Because there's nothing else to do. <laughs> but then, to do it consistently, oh, that's the tough part. So, how do we strike that balance? Uh, take something, something manageable, that you can do every day. And you do it over one week, two weeks, three weeks. And then, after a while, there's this momentum. Uh, then you'll see it. Okay, um, the problem here is if we are always, we have to get to that, um, you know, get to the groove, so to speak, where we become habituated to a retreat mindset. Okay, then once we are back into the grind of uh, work life, family life, daily life, and then we get into that other mindset, which is the fast paced, frantic, right, you know, kind of thing, um, then it's so hard to get back to that retreat mindset again. So this is the thing where we play rock on either side, but never coming to settle on something that really so-called works. Exactly. Uh, in, in the words of one friend, a uh, student, uh, she's actually still in NTU studying, going for her final year next year. Uh, in her own words, she said, every time she comes for, for my talks, she'll get into this Dharma book. And then after the talk, there was once she, she told me, Shuko, I can't do this. I said, what? I, I, can't, I can't do this because after your talk, I just, I just feel like school is, is pointless. <laughs> 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 yeah, she, 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 that's her exact word. And she said, now I have to switch mode again. I have to switch mode. You know, my point is it. To switch back. And then after switching, then she will tell me like, now I switch mode. I can't, it's hard, hard to switch back to Dharma mode. <laughs> Every time she comes for talks, or come and ask me questions, then she has to switch back. So this is fake thought. This is fake thought. Uh, perhaps initially, for most people, we do that. Yeah. Initially, we, we tend to fake thought because we tend to see the practice as apart from our life. And that's, that's for uh, practicing Buddhism again. <laughs> not that we are not practicing, that's why we fake thought. It's because initially we try to practice them, we, we, we see this dichotomy. Like it's a false kind of dichotomy. It doesn't have to be separate. <clears throat> and it starts from the, the very practice we do. 
we tend to see as, oh, when I meditate, then I be mindful. When I'm not meditating, I'm not meditating. You know? Perhaps it's got to do with the way we understand those terms. If you can bear with me for a while. You know that term, uh, meditate, like metta bhavana. How would you all translate? Loving kindness and meditation. Yes. Yeah. Loving kindness and meditation. But the term bhavana actually don't translate into meditation. Meditation is a form of bhavana, but not the whole thing. Translated to Chinese is Siu Si, not, not rest, uh. <laughs> but Siu Si has Siu Si Guan Si, repeated cultivation, repeated practice. Yeah. A close approximation would be cultivation in English. If you look at the various sutta, such as Satipatthana Sutta, the Four Foundations of Awakeness, uh, the Buddha didn't just say sit there and meditate. In fact, he mentioned about uh, Mindfulness throughout the day. You know, whether you are sing, so, 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 so. whether you are walking, standing, sitting, even lying down. Even when you are wearing your robes, of course you are not wearing robes, when you are wearing your clothing, very, very mundane daily activities. In fact, there was one article that I mentioned in Indian religion, they, they almost never mentioned about practice when they talk about uh, going to the toilet because it's considered to be impure or dirty. But then in the, in the sutta, it says, do it mindfully. <laughs> in, Buddhist, in Buddhist teaching, there's, there's nothing so impure about toilets. Although in later tradition, sometimes people say, oh, go to the toilet, cannot chant Buddha's name. Huh? <laughs> like once got to uh, uh, certain discussion or oh, okay. debate, if you will. Uh, but that's another story. So to me, it's about uh, maintaining a certain practice. And I'm not suggest suggesting that everybody must meditate or must practice mindfulness. Uh, but even if, let's say, you are, you are practicing pure land meditation or pure land practice, that means that throughout the day, you are always anchoring yourself back to the full heart yeah, or the qualities of the Buddha. Yeah. And, in, and talking about which, within pure land practice, it's not just Therefore, yes, it's not yeah, if behind that or before that is invoking Buddhichita. So imagine if every, every single moment you are invoking Buddhichita, how powerful is that? So mm -hmm. I think that that would uh, that should get us started. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, we live here in Singapore and you know we want to have our good jobs, we want our good food, uh, we want our kids to go to good schools. Uh, and you can't help but feel that you have to compete okay, all the time. Uh, if you don't compete, you either get the scraps okay, or nothing. Yeah. Uh, so, as a typical Singaporean resident to say, yeah, in this case, I better start to be kiasu and bread what I can. Uh, so, people around this person uh, will say, um, would, would just uh, not be able to just sit there and do nothing. They would just be you know, influenced by this one person and everyone just follow and it's a domino effect where everybody starts to follow the leader and eventually instead of trying to be that unique Buddhist practicing mindfulness being contented with uh, what we have we ended up running you know along with everybody else for the red 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 so you know how should we when we feel this compelling feeling uh, how should we react in the right way as Buddhists the easy model answer uh, is, uh, let's come back to the to the basics, you know. Uh, let's come back to the basics. Live a life of simplicity. But if it's that, if it's that simple, then you all, you wouldn't be asking this question. Uh, but then it's actually really that simple. The question is, how often oh, I must bring it closer. <laughs> the, the the question is, how often do we make friends with the Dharma? In the in the Sutta, the Buddha mentioned uh, four qualities. Let's just focus on the first one for, for the sake of this discussion. To associate with good spiritual friends, loosely translated. Uh, the Buddha declared that who is the good spiritual friend? 
the Tathagata, referring to himself, the Buddha. Well, the Buddha has passed away to Mahaparinibbana. <laughs> the next best is the Dhamma. Of course, in today's context, we often refer to, to the spiritual teachers, uh, whether lay or monastic. Uh, but more importantly, it's the Dharma that we have to connect with. Uh, why do I say that? Because ultimately it's our views, our mindset, in other words, that drives our actions. You are right. Uh, who wants to be left behind? Who wants to be left out? Uh, everybody wants to stay ahead. Uh, and it's not just about chaos, chaos, or whatever. Uh, recently I wrote an article about the haze. <coughs> With the haze, everybody queue up uh, and everybody try to stop that stop power. The funny thing is that I didn't try to stop power during one of the class. I was I was given quite a quite a bit by different students. Then the next day the haze was gone. <laughs> so I have, I have this big plastic bag of of N95. <laughs> I wonder how we call Kiasuism. In some countries, they call it passion. <laughs> yeah. yeah, serious. Because I noticed that in the papers, sometimes they will talk about oh, the launch of the, late, the newest iPhone, and they will capture scenes in the US. I know they will, they will show the queue, and even on the national TV, they will, they will you know, do live coverage. And they, they make it like, wow, look at how passionate they are, these Apple fans, you know? And Singapore press, oh, is this sensitive? No. <laughs> uh, but this is quite observed, you know. They will, they will just take that and then say, oh, look at how passionate they are. But then if Singaporeans do the same thing, kiasu. Is that okay? But I'm not suggesting that, I'm not suggesting that we should do that or continue to do that. But I think there should be uh, a reason why we do that. Uh, and perhaps it's because, really because we can't sue. We are too afraid of failing. We are too afraid of failing. Or we, we think that we will fail if we don't do this, we don't do that. Maybe we should have more self-confidence, you know? Maybe. Uh, but to have self-confidence needs us to really look inwards. Yeah. Again, it's really about looking inwards. Introspection. Because if we just keep looking upwards and compare, uh, that's where a lot of insecurities and a lot of uncertainty and anxiety comes about. But when we look at this, when we know that yes, I'm a good person, not just a nice person, but I'm a good person, I'm worthy, and I have not just nice, uh, few good qualities, but I, am, I have skills that is needed in a society as well. My child is a good person. When we stop looking at our child as just a student with grades and numbers, that's when we will stop thinking that way. But when we teach and hold our, our son, our daughter, as just a student, and the only world is their grades, we are short changing ourselves. This is what I shared with some students in, uh, in NTU and in NUS, as I am. <coughs> I ask them this simple question, what are you? And they're like, what are you? Yeah, what are you? They gave different answers. Some say human being, Singaporean, Malaysian, boy, girl, you know, then some say student, you know, or son, daughter. And we went quite a bit. Then I said, yeah, just just have a step back and take a, take a look. There are so many things, you know. When the Buddha say no self, we tend to say, oh, uh, yeah, no self. But it's to me, it's in context with the fact that if you identify with any of this as you and you alone, then you are in trouble. Because that is going to change. Because that is dependent on many conditions to come about. And it's going to change. It will change. Isn't it? It's not a question of if, but a question of when. And on top of that, the larger context in this case is there are so many roles that we play. If we just identify and cling on to this as me, and something happened to that, then we collapse. Which is what happens when those uh, middle-aged, the, the, the mid-life crisis, you know, 
when they have identified so strong, strongly with their career and say, this is who I am, I'm a manager, I'm a this, I'm a that, and then suddenly there's a reward. Oh, sorry, your team has been cut by half. Sorry, you, you have a choice. You either go to China or go to uh, Vietnam or you will be retrenched. It's no longer just about the paycheck or losing a job. It's about losing a sense of identity. And that's why people really feel oh, lost. Or how about if you look at Japan where a lot of retirees go into depression and commit suicide. Again, it, to me, it's about this cling on to their job as their self. I'm not suggesting that everybody should quickly attain our hand oh, that would be nice. But before that, one direct application is to realize that there are many roles we play. And if we, if we start pigeonholing our kids into I'm a student with grades, and that's all I'm worth, it's very sad. Look at our child and say, hey, this is my son. Whether he gets A's or not, he's my son. He's someone's friend. He's my parents' grandchildren. He is a person, not just grades. You know? The moment we start to look at the person as a person, then perhaps we'll, we'll, we'll be able to overcome the council, council things. Because if we just try to work on the council things, we're working on the branches and not on the root itself. So actually you're saying, uh, going back to the point about fear of failure, that uh, we have so much uh, mental concept of ourselves okay, that we, we, we have a very uh, strong perception of a false concept of ourselves yes. and that results in our feeling so nervous that any time we fail, you know, everything just collapses. Yes. Feel the fear that if this one thing is short, if it, it, it falls short of that idea that of success, then it's gone. But in fact, it's okay. It's okay. So how, how do we actually um, learn to cope or deal with feelings of fear of failure? <laughs> In the mental sense, I have, I have a very strange way to, to deal with that. Uh, when I go back to NTU, I will tell them about my disaster. <laughs> Some of them have heard it so many times they can repeat it for me. <laughs> I will tell them about how I totally messed up my second year. Totally. I totally messed it up. So much so that I, I had to do one more semester. But there's something to be learned from that, that mistake. Yeah. And of course for me personally it was that, yeah, if you don't study, you fail. But then there's another lesson that came much later. When I went out to, to, the, to the industry, what I found is that when I went for interviews, most companies, they will just check with you. And sometimes they will flip through your results, sometimes. Sometimes they don't even care. Because they're, they're not hiring someone to do exam papers. <laughs> so they want to talk to you and they want to really know whether you know your stuff. And occasionally they will flip and they're like, hmm, can we look at your second year results? And they're like, what happened? Because they're like, you know, really happy and then suddenly, hmm? Then I'll tell them, I say, ah, yes, yes, about that. <laughs> um, I, I got too, too, too complacent in year one. I thought, ah, no big deal, you know. Ah. And then I really mess it up. But if you flip the page and look at year three, this is where you see most of my days. <laughs> and usually they just move on. Usually they just move on. And my point to the undergrads is that if you don't fail in something, in your, in your student, when are you going to fail? You know? When are you going to fail? The, the point is that I, I totally messed up year two and I still got, got a job in R&D. Not that the company is bad, but I realized that people in this world, we need to have more faith in people. That people are willing to forgive your mistakes. They're not going to just pin you to the wall and say, ah, look at him, he failed year two. It's okay, you know? Because we all do stupid things once in a while. We're not Perfect, we're not enlightened. It's okay to fail, to, to not be number one. You know? And even when I went out to work, I'm sure all of us at work, we mess it up once in a while. So. And if I may, I, I, there was one project that involved, I shouldn't mention the company, <laughs> but it was a very really major goof up. And I was so worried that, boy, this is going to end my career really soon. The MD, MD had to step in, sit down with me, 
And then she looked at me and she said, you know that this is very serious. I said, yes, I absolutely understand. And I take full responsibility and uh, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> of course, that day I didn't say blah, blah, blah. And then she looked at me and she said, all I want to know from you is that you, you know the gravity of this and you know that uh, you shouldn't do this again. <laughs> and that's the end of it, she said. This is this is a one-time write-off and you, you, you will, it doesn't have any bearings on your performance in the future. Because the last thing I want to do is let you keep getting worried about what happened. I want you to move on from here and then do your best for the next project. I was like, absolutely. And then she left and I was like, <laughs> So time and again, whether in school or at work, I realized that we have to have more confidence in people. I've counseled many individuals who say, Oh no, Sufu cannot. You don't understand my boss. If I say no, he'll fire me. I said, No, seriously. If your boss fire you because you, you say no once, I think you should fire him first. <laughs> No boss in their right frame of mind will just fire a person because the person um, say no once. Unless you keep saying no and you just have no reason to back yourself up. Have more confidence in people. Not just others, but yourself as well. Not just yourself, but others. Um, you know, we, we work so hard and we have this... Uh, maybe it's easy to fail when we're students, but when we move up the ladder in our career, then it gets like higher and higher from the floor yes. and then the fear of dropping is even greater yes. and uh, you know that, that puts us in a very uh, nervous situation and I think as we move up we just feel more and more fear to, to, to fail so the thing is that yeah I, I think we actually start to feel that there's more at stake when we actually move up and we have to play some tricks, do some stuff just to stay alive and uh, if let's say one, we make one false move up there, then you know, we don't crash down and then it's all over for us, that kind of thing. So, how do we deal with that? Look at me. <coughs> I'm a monk. And many people think that monks are supposed to know everything. <laughs> but I don't. You see, the thing about me is that I just tell people I don't know everything. So, no more pressure, no more stress. But people don't believe. They still think that I know everything. But that's their problem, not mine. <laughs> There was once during Vesa in comics, uh, I, I had to, if I had stayed in my room, nothing would have happened, you know, because I'm not required to walk around. But then I itchy back, you know, walk around. And then one, one day, they had this uh, three gems temple tour thing, and they were, they were outside that Tasuk uh, Kautin, they the main hall for Sakyamuni Buddha. And then when I approached, the whole group of you was like, Ah, so what you say? Let's ask him. I was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> As I approached, they were like, Shifu, you got a question to ask you? I said, okay, sure, ask. And they pointed up to the ceiling. And on the ceiling is this beautiful, like, a corning thing, like a, like a lotus. And then there's this old money coming home. And in the center, there's this, this Sanskrit word symbol thing, which until today I still don't know. And then they asked me, what is that? <laughs> Since I don't know even now, I didn't even know what I meant. So I said, oh, you got me, I don't know. And they're like, hey, Sifu, come on, now, tell us. <laughs> 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 because they're part of, they're part of on, on, on this like tour thing, and they're supposed to answer questions. So they thought, I purposely don't tell them, you know? <laughs> it's, and they thought, no, I'm serious, I don't know. And they look at me, Okay, then, then they realized I'm serious. <laughs> okay. uh, I, I'm not sure whether it was more traumatizing for them to know that I don't know, or was it for me? No, definitely not traumatizing for me. I think it was more traumatizing for them. I think a lot of times we make assumptions, but assumptions are not evil or bad by itself. For example, who knows if this is going to collapse? No, it's, not, it's probably not going to collapse. It's that it's going to be it's not going to collapse. But we make such assumptions. How many of you stay on a high, in a, in a high-rise building? Raise your hand. Most of us do. Oh, actually, it's a small number. Indeed, WTM, venerable. Uh, before the break, you shared with us about dealing with common problems at work. Huh? 
Uh, now we'll take a look into the Buddhism toolbox and see what's available to help us deal with these problems. Okay, uh, remember, what can we do to attain a calm and humane mind? Okay, even while pursuing all these needs at once. Uh, the question here is do we really need to give up one and uh, or go the other? Or can we actually develop a little path and attitude towards it? In the earlier segment, we touched mostly on uh, our mindset. And early, earlier in the break, I uh, shared with you about how uh, it, it brings to mind the teachings of, uh, of the Buddha on the Dongle and Fuka. Uh, we, we, we know about how it starts with right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. Uh, and in most texts, then it is sorted according to the three practices uh, Sila, Samadhi, and Panya. But then if you look at this listing, it starts with Panya instead of with Sila. Uh, instead of Tia Ting Kui, it starts with Kui, then Tia and Ting. Because this practice is supposed to say Kui. But then how do you start with Kui to begin with? The right view. Partly why we covered so much on the attitude, the mindset. Because if our mindset is not set, uh, it's hard to drive ourselves to, to do the practice. I mean, all of us have tried some practice already. Yeah, but what is driving us? Yeah, so I hope the earlier segment have covered, uh, given us a bit of uh, questions. I hope it didn't just give you answer, but make you think and have more questions. Yeah? And it's through the questions that they compel us to go and explore. Yeah? Like what exactly can we do? Uh, there's this exercise that I give did this Italian Jew uh, and told him he, he, he's a prime example. He's a businessman and he has a company, tour company. Uh, and he's, he's, he just says, uh, Master, I'm just too busy. Uh, I have no time. <laughs> and perhaps and he is probably too busy. And he's very busy. So how? I told him, I said, um, at work, uh, I'm sure you will take leaves, right? Uh, you feel stressed, but you, you still will take leaves. Why are you waiting for the leaf to come? You can meditate. Uh -huh. While you're standing there, waiting for the leaf yourself, thinking, why isn't the leaf coming yet? Just, just watch your standing posture. Watch your standing posture. Bring the focus on the, on the mind to the body to the feet, up to the thumb, to the knees, to the hip, to the back, and then to the chest, and observe the breathing. <coughs> observe the breathing. But that's very simple, and I'm almost back to that. So what's the, the, the issue here? The issue is that we usually try to do the practice when, when we, only when we need it. And when do we need it? We say, oh, I'm, I feel very stressed at work. And we only try to practice when we are stressed. That's like saying, uh, having athletes train only when it, it, is the, it is the competition. Athletes train before competition, not during competition. All of us uh, Singaporeans, uh, male, we serve fairness. Not because we are at war. Yeah? Not because, precisely because we are not at war, that's why we are training. So that one day, if it sh should so happen, where will we be? We are, we are studying throughout the whole year. We are a teacher now. Yes. Hong Seng is a teacher. Yes. Yes. <laughs> 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 I was like, oh no, did I forget something? Yes. Yes, I am. The students study the whole year, not because there is exams throughout the whole year. Yeah. We don't have exams throughout the whole year. But we did it in Russia. Okay. <laughs> 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 but yeah, you don't have it every day. Yeah. I think we start every day. Yeah. Why? Because it is through these regular practices when there's no exams that during exams you can perform. You can perform. So uh, start start off in your daily life. Yeah. Small little things. When you wake up in the morning before you just jump out and get on with the line, uh, sit on your bed and just take a few deep breaths and reflect on how, how 
yesterday we sleep and today we actually wake up. Yeah. This is this actual practice I do myself. That I check various individuals to me. And then just recite uh, number one same for some ten times. I don't think I do recite a hundred thousand times or something. That's ten times. But do each each recitation meaning it. Yeah. Don't don't just rush through it and once it I mean <laughs> no point, you know. But just do ten sincerely. Stay with it and inside. And then reflect. Wow, oh, I'm alive. Whatever happened yesterday, whatever happened in the past one week, one month, one year, we all face a lot of challenges, a lot of difficulties, I mean, okay, maybe not so much. But we have gone through bad times. But reflect, when we wake up in the morning, hey, I'm still alive, I'm okay. No? I'm okay. I've counseled a couple of cancer patients. There are, there are those who are fighting for their life. For most of us, we are not. But then, we, when, we, when we forget about that, then suddenly our priority is, you know, fleet. So start the day with that, and then ask yourself sincerely, how am I going to live this single day? And start up on that. And then go to do the wash up, and look at the mirror, look at yourself. Really examine yourself. As we brush our teeth, before we brush our teeth, smile at yourself. Right? Learn to smile. I've, I've, uh, I've, I've counseled someone who frowns so much that his normal state is like this. I said, no, stop not frowning. He said, no, I'm not frowning. He's <laughs> <laughs> like that. I feel very sorry for him. So I, I, I literally reach out and say, don't have anything against problem. But think about it. Try to think about something that be while frowning. <laughs> or try to think about something upset, or something frustrating or smiling. Try. You find that it, as you think about some event, it contorts your, your, your face, you know. It brings that emotion out as well. But the more we do, the more we smile or the more we frown, then it's a, it's a habit as well. It's a habit as well. Because the, the smile of the facial expression doesn't just come about by itself. It's like speech. Yeah, in, in the Yoga Chara, in the Sastra, you should see here, there's one verse. Before we speak, we think a lot already. Likewise, before we express something, a lot of mental processes has gone through. This mental habituation. Then beyond that, as we go through day to day, and the whole day, uh, take opportunities to just sit silently. Or whether it's at the leaf, you just stand silently and just watch. If you are driving, uh, okay, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> no, we can still do a mindfulness. Yeah. Drive mindfully, yeah? yeah. You can do it, but slightly different from Samantha. Don't do Samantha free driving. <laughs> <laughs> but watch yourself, you know, while you are driving. Are you thinking about other things? Come back to the, to the car, to the road. And if someone can't you, watch yourself. Do you just, or uh, do you just call? Maybe the person is really in a rush. We will say, ah, oh, so what was the rush? Maybe the person is really in a rush. Maybe the, the father is going to pass away or something. Not like I'm guessing what. But you know, you never know. You never know. But ah, uh, for those who are driving, it's funny because now the whole COE price is so high. Right? Yeah. And people rush. I, I wonder, you pay so much for this thing that costs more than a full flat in Sengkang now. The BTO plan that HDB just released. Yeah, the COD itself is more than the, the cost of the, the whole house. So I ask, I tell my student, I say, before you start the car, get in and look around. This, this is a, car, a piece of machine that you spend, I don't know how much you spend. Okay, I shouldn't mention it, but whoever is in front, like, how, how much do you spend for your car? <laughs> Cheaper than the Cheaper than the 
but still not like 5,000, you know, like many tens of thousand dollars. So the next time I get in a car, spend more time in your car. What's the rush? Just three or five minutes, just sit there. And then this is your small retreat center. Don't tell me you cannot find a quiet place. Close your door, don't start your engine and choke yourself, okay? But then you can play some nice chant, an old money table, or uh, meta chanting. And just, just breathe and relax. And this is the time so that you don't spend half an hour long. Before you go to work, just look at and say, okay, today I'm going to try. You know, whatever happened yesterday, I got upset. Today, if it happens again, I will try to overcome that. Try. A lot of aspiration making is, is needed. Don't think lightly of that. Don't think, ah, but this is just, you know, routine. Don't make it a routine. It will only be a routine if you make it a routine. Make aspiration. Ah, yeah. You'll be surprised. It's, it may sound like it's just words, you know, but it's only just words and wishful thinking if we don't act upon them. The funny thing is that if you say it often enough, one day you have it. Then I go to work, and when I'm coming back from the office, stay in the car for a while, make it easy. I'm told you're spending so much money on this car. To me, get it started, then you may find that it's easier for you to then do your regular good job. Even if you, if you can only start off just lighting an incense. When I was a lay person, uh, back, back, back in that you, there was a period of time in year three, every morning, same routine, about seven o'clock, wake up, uh, offer water, I didn't offer incense, press water, then uh, chanting, sing uh, then I think one round of the uh, hop, then meditate. That's half an hour. Very short. It's very beautiful. Yeah. And, and to me, it's, the important thing is what you can manage. Maybe it's too long for some of us. Yeah. Maybe you want to consider waking up earlier, sleeping earlier, and waking up just 15 minutes earlier. The important thing is to do something that you can sustain. When I think back to how, uh, even much younger, my, my, my mom would always say, at least some this young, at least offer an incense. Today, when I think about it, wow, oh, that's actually a very powerful practice. You don't think like me of just offering an incense. Because if you say, okay, from today on, I'm going to offer incense, and just repeat, Namo, Francis, Namo, for three times, and power three times, and then I go to work, or do whatever I do. To be able to do it consistently, that's mental strength. You know, that's right effort. And build discipline to and build discipline. And only through that discipline that other of the faculties, other practices can take place. I mean, among all of us here, who don't know how to meditate? Who don't know what no way for huh? But the question is to be able to do it consistently. To actually do it when you need it. When your boss is giving you a hard time, when 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 it's crunch time, who don't know that we should be compassionate, that we should be forgiving, we should be patient, but to be able to do it, that requires a lot of strength, mental strength. Uh, we are surrounded by family members, be it our children, our in-laws, our own parents. Um, they may not be practitioners, or they are too young to practice, for instance, kids. So how do we influence them to, to do something like a practice that what can they do to help us achieve our practice? Mm. You'll be surprised how, how capable kids are. Uh, uh, the Buddha said, we all have the Buddha nature. We all have Buddha nature. <coughs> Sometimes it's easy to give up. You know? uh, after this Dharma talk, maybe you go back, oh, at least I can do it. And tomorrow gets colder, my boss starts to fed up. <laughs> and then maybe you, you just relax. And maybe you feel like, ah, I, I, I never amount to anything. To me, it's very important to have patience with ourselves, to have compassion with ourselves. There's a reason, you know, last time we, we, we learned Mita, Karuna, Mita, Bhavana. At that point, I, I was always like, why, why are we so self-centered to start with ourselves? And of course, we, we 
we just accepted the order and said, oh, we have to have another people we can give. But I realized over the years that while that is true, it is even more important for our practice because we tend to, when we try to practice and we fail, then we become uh, disheartened. And to me, that is actually a very negative force. So to have compassion for ourselves, that yes, it's okay. <laughs> not that it's okay not to practice, but yes, it's okay to fail. Okay, we come back to that. It's okay to fail. I'm not perfect, but I'm going to try again. And not just say, oh, I, I failed. You know, I, I didn't observe the precepts. Oh, I failed in bits. I didn't chant today, so tomorrow forget it. You know, yesterday I didn't chant, so today forget it. It's easy to become disheartened, but to come back and say, hey, I have this potential. My God is our children. So what can they do? Something very simple. Just prostrate. You know, simple prostration, operate in sense. And just recite three times. Something that is horrible. But most importantly, do it with them. To begin with, we must be doing it already. You know, it's easy. Why you come and do Why did you never do it? <laughs> you know? But if we do it consistently ourselves, and we show them that we are doing the larger set, I'm just asking you to do a simple one. Ah, then, even if, you know, they, they inside them, they, they don't feel like doing it, they have like, okay, I have to do it. You know, like my father is doing it, and he's doing it the set. So, lead by example. Now, these are standard model answers, all of us know. But to do it, so do the practice ourselves, and when we benefit ourselves, when we have shown that it changes our life, Oh, then we know it inside. Yes, this is really good. Because it's one thing to say, yeah, we, we want our children to learn Dharma. But if we are not convinced that Dharma is really good for us, then you will, there's always this like, if we throw a bit of time, okay, I'm going to You know? But if we are really convinced, we're like, no, we must do it. Much like how parents are forcing their kids to the admission in class. Because they are convinced that this is good. So we need to be convinced ourselves that Dharma is good for ourselves. Then, not that we are going to force them, then it will influence them. Okay, being a Buddhist and if we do this kind of practice in the office, let's say we, we start to have a very good epic, we, we do meditation with our boss for us, you know, we do some mantras, we will start to look a little different from our colleagues. And our colleagues will notice it. And uh, do we want to hide that or do we actually let it show? Well, thank you for asking that. <laughs> the last thing I want you to do is go to the office at 8 plus 9 and then start. No, no, no. Not that there's anything wrong with chanting, but there's a time and place for different things, okay? That's one thing. It is, it's one thing to say, let me not hide the fact that I'm Buddhist. It's another thing to start doing chanting in our office. <laughs> Not that any of you is going to do that. Are you going to do that? <laughs> yeah. I think sometimes the myth, the myth that if we let people know that we are Buddhist, then we be sacrificed. Right? There's this stigma. And to me, the funny thing is that this stigma, this idea that, oh, if you let people know that we are Buddhist, then your career opportunity will just dim. You know, if you look at the glass ceiling, it's all false. It's really false. And sometimes, strangely, it is perpetuated by us who this ourselves because of our own fear that, yeah, yeah there's people out there and nobody is not us. No, it's not true. I think if you work in a good company, you know, all companies should be good. I think most people are professional enough, again, have faith in people. That they will be professional enough that even if they know that they are Buddhist, they will not then make excuses to make things they get for you. And even if they do, it's only human to do that, isn't it? They are the kind of respect. Yeah? So there's even more reason to have compassion for them. But don't let that become a reason to say, I should hide that I'm a Buddhist. But again, it's a fine line. If, for example, if you are a, let's say, um, if you are an administrator or you are a service desk person and a person comes to you for assistance, you should render your professional services and only that. You shouldn't let it go like, oh, by the way, sometimes I try, you know, 
my, com my, my computer is, is down, I just shut down into the phone. <laughs> I mean, that would be ridiculous. You know, that, that would not be about letting people know that you're Buddhist. That would be letting people know that you're crazy. <laughs> you know? And, and, and unprofessional. I think it's important to know the difference. And look, uh, we can definitely do our practices. If, for example, the company allows you your own time, one hour lunch break, that you're free to do whatever you do in your cases, you can always do your meditation. Yeah? But it's not just that. Um, in, in some traditions, they have this practice where, for example, I hear people say, in the office, very noisy, no phone ring, and things like that. But sometimes I find that we, we are too eager to respond. Phone ring, then it must, it must be there. You know, email, it didn't, you know, then it must try to check. Yeah. And now with handphones, mobile phones, fast app, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all kinds, you know. Uh, it's okay for them to come. Buddhist practice is not about shutting the whole world up in order to have peace. It's not about that. It's not about telling everybody to shut up so that you can have peace. It's about being able to be at peace with all this. When you hear the sound, why not then take it as a reminder? Ah, okay, there's sound, hearing, hearing. And then, okay, take the time to respond to it. And, and that practice itself doesn't have to be up loud. Oh, I'm a Buddhist, hello. <laughs> yeah. Alright, so I think by doing that, we can practice. Uh, we can practice without being too in your face that I'm a Buddhist. But at the same time, we shouldn't have to hide. No one has, not just Buddhists, no one should have to hide the fact that they have a certain faith or religion. But uh, not to impose their beliefs or religion on others. Uh, when we work, uh, we have also got to tell lies at times. Then uh, that becomes a problem. I think it's a really? classic, classic question. <laughs> yeah, classic Buddhist question. So, uh, so do we have to tell lies or <laughs> what? <laughs> do we have to tell lies? <laughs> most, most often, quoted by those in sales and marketing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a pity that the camera doesn't show, but then you know. <laughs> 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 in the future when they are camera camera soon. <laughs> <and assume. laughs> but I, I always ask people this question. Given that most people think in this way, and if most people act upon that, then everybody should be successful. But it's not true. If, if it's true that to be successful you must lie, then everybody who lie is successful. But no, not everybody who lie is successful. Likewise, is, is it true that all who are successful all lie? I don't think so. I don't think so. So, first of all, by logic, it is not true. Second, uh, in terms of actual experience, Back then in consulting, uh, consulting is between the technical side and sales because you don't need to do business development and so on and so forth. And many times I actually tell the client, you don't need this really. <laughs> this is overkill. Why do you need a whole full active directory and with, with everything just to do what you want to do? You can, you can easily get a third party solution. The funny thing is that, from my own experience, when you tell the clients that, they look at you and they're like, I can trust this guy. I can trust this person because he's not going to try to fleece me. There's only that many times you can lie, you know? Right? There are many sales people who lie, yes, it's true. And they, they lie once to get a deal, lie twice to get a deal. But after all, in the market, you get the reputation of the guy, and always, you, you must discount these numbers. Right? And you will come to the point where people want only come to you when they have no choice. So the question is really, do you want to work in this way? Do you want to do business in this way? I think we have a choice. We do have a choice. So we're not going to move in a very slow motion and like that. Oh, no, no, no. I'm not encouraging people to be laid back or what the good is. So not attachment, not craving, not desire. Um. <laughs> no, in fact, I, I encourage people 
uh, those those recent grads would attest to it. I, I told them about how they should really like, you know, go for it. My my work attitude as a Buddhist is this. When I finish my work, I go to my boss for more work. And when they finish that, I go for more. I go until my boss run out of things on me to do. <laughs> Serious, I tried. I tried an internship, I tried an R&D, I tried an consultant. I managed to wear out my boss. <laughs> you see, the thing is that most of us, or many people, many people have this idea that, oh, uh, if I go and ask for more, then my boss is going to give me more and I'll be uh, taken advantage of. Or then I will have no more time. The funny thing is that when I did that, I came to the point where my boss ran out of things on me. You see, for many of us who are managers at this point, you know that before you get something to your staff to do, you need to do some preparation. Then while the, the, the staff is doing, you need to monitor. And when the staff has finished, you need to verify. So it's a long good background that your staff don't know. And so when your staff keep coming back for more, the pressure is on, on you as a manager. And up to some point, you're like, I can't keep up. Okay, go away. <laughs> Which is what my, my boss back then told me. He said, going back again. You see what happened is that, again, I repeat all those stories, but I think it's just <laughs> not When I finished my code, and then the other, team, the other part of the team is not ready, I look at my code and I'm like, hmm, <coughs> what can I do with this? So I thought, oh, maybe I can rewrite this part so that it's multi-threaded instead of single-threaded, and I can improve the, the performance, you know? So I went back to my boss and said, can I try this? I said, well, I thought you got that. Yeah, I know, I want to try. <laughs> they said, okay, let's go break the code. We went back a few hours later, I came back, I'm done. Check in the read. Can you compile and test? You see, I'm giving him work now. <laughs> Each time I finish my work, I check in, he has to compile, he has to test. He cannot just assume it's okay. So I'm giving him work. <laughs> then when, when he comes in, okay, done, go. Then I came back, right. look at it. Maybe I can reflect that the whole architecture and try this new thing. <laughs> And I again go back to him. I tried this three, four times in a day. <laughs> or, or, or a few days. Up to some point, he's like, okay, no more changes. I said, just one more. No, no more. You're done. <laughs> I gotta see you for the next few days. Go to the pantry, go to the canteen, whatever you do, we you say, but sleep. I don't care. Only come back when I call for you. <laughs> you see, the funny thing is that when you do that, then you have time for yourself. Then you can do your meditation and no one can touch you really. <laughs> then, when you are done with your meditation or you take a nap, then you say, okay, maybe I should improve myself mentally, which is what I did. Which prepares me for more things in the future. Which means I can finish my work faster and it becomes a virtuous cycle for me. And of course, for my boss, it becomes even more stressful. <laughs> so no, I don't think it is right for Buddhists to, to uh, uh, use the teachings of unconsciously use the teachings to justify a mid-back lifestyle. But this may pose a question. Are you suggesting very well that we should become really fierce and aggressive at work? Wouldn't that be against the Buddha's teaching? I think it's a finite between being aggressive towards people versus being passionate about our work and doing our best. You have 8 hours, 9, or maybe more than 10, 12 hours for rest <laughs> of work if you, if you think about it, do your best, learn something. This is our life we're talking about, you know? It's not just work. It's our life. Every single second, every single hour is our life. It's our own precious human life. And if we subscribe to the Buddha's teaching, it is the fruit of past good deeds, you know? These are the results of our merits. Don't waste it away. Make full use of it. But don't just do it for ourselves. In the past, or if you think about it, people also yeah, you know, really go all the way up. Yeah? But now, when you do your best, it's not just to gain it for ourselves. It doesn't have to be. If you get a bonus or whatever, you can ask yourself. You can think, oh, maybe little bit, maybe some money. 
<laughs> yeah, or maybe we can we can use that money in a more meaningful way. Yeah. Support your your family members, support your friends, support those who need support, charities, and so on. So it's no, no longer working for yourself, no longer working to satisfy yourself. That it's becomes gratitude. Yes, the Buddhist after gratitude. That becomes very important. That work becomes your practice ground. Okay, our final question. Uh, Pedro, what would you do today if you were still a man, striving hard to make a living for your family in Singapore? I'll be giving those of you in the I who are in the IT industry a run for our money. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when I read that question <laughs> earlier, I was thinking, that's an interesting question. Um, sometime uh, recently, I thought about a similar question. Uh, not so related, but similar. I thought about, hey, people, I, I counsel different people, some families, some individuals who are working, and I ask myself, wow, oh, is it really so challenging and tough? And when I think about it, at this point in time, like if you ask me now, now, at this point in time, I really have no interest <laughs> to pursue whatever career, even if that's enough. I really have no, no interest. I mean, back then, I knew in my heart that, yeah, I'm doing this, but my mind was really set towards motherhood. Even before that, before my final decision, I knew in my heart that I can put aside my career anytime. But hypothetically speaking, if, say, for example, I were to consider if for a lay person, you know, working in a, in a, in a society, for the family and so on. What should be the attitude? What should be the mindset? I think I've shared more or less with you. Um, go to work. Don't think about, oh, uh, I want to, uh, I, must, I must get both that bonus or I must get that raise, then I'll be happy. It's okay not to get that bonus. It's okay not to get that raise. Sometimes, again, we come back to the assumption that we need this to be happy, we need that to be happy. Just now we were having a chat in the session about how, how there are those families who are on social grants and then having the latest, greatest Samsung Galaxy. What? Four. Five. Is this one of them? Four. Four. S4. 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 Yeah. We come back to the mindset. I think... Uh, Sometimes we think that that's, that's really mystic, right? That if you practice, you cannot be successful. If you are successful, you cannot be practicing. I don't think so. I think if you look at all the Bodhisattvas, they are very successful people. They are not, they are not laid back, you know? but they are really successful, not for themselves, but for all sorts of things. We may not be, we may think more about super that's too high, you know. Recently, this, there was this devotee, this, uh, she keeps telling me, but she I'm not, I'm not you, uh, I'm not a uh, I cannot do this. Don't, don't think later of ourselves. We can be a Buddhist Sattva in our own ways. At home, be a Buddhist Sattva to our family. Because when you think about it, to be a Buddhist Sattva doesn't mean, oh, at the Sati Pusa period, a 10th stage, then you are a Buddhist Sattva. Kwan Sin Pusa, he didn't be a Bodhisattva only when he attained this. It is because he started becoming a Bodhisattva that he became 10 stage Bodhisattva, that he become he attained Buddha. Bodhisattvas, the Buddhas, don't think, oh, when I attain Buddha, then I will be a Bodhisattva. Then I will be a Buddha. No. They start off like where we are now. Like where we are now. It is where we are now that we need to start to cultivate Bodhisattva, this aspiration, don't think we tell ourselves. We can do this, we are Bodhisattvas, we are, we have this Buddha nature. In our own interviews, to be a Bodhisattva, Bodhisattva, Jue Yu Sin, to be awakened and also to awaken others. But what does it mean to be awakened? <coughs> to see things clearly. 
Kwan for a purpose. So that you can be truly happy. In other words, help others to be happy, you know, to, to be in a simplistic way. If you cannot be awakened to the ultimate truth yet, you know, maybe start to do something small. Look around with uh, opportunities, people around us, whether at home or at work, or with our friends. Ask yourself, always keep asking yourself, how can I be a Buddhist to this person? Maybe it's as simple as just giving a smile. As simple as when you see someone, that's it. Hello, how are you today? And they genuinely about it from their heart. Maybe that's all it, it, it takes to get started, you know? Try. Sure. Thank you, Venerable, for your time to the test tonight. Uh, it's been a most interesting conversation. Um, we hope that you can have you again with us on TWTM. Uh, by the way, the recording is available on YouTube, uh, just for Dharma with the Masters. Uh, we hope all of you have benefited from this uh, session and we look forward to having you with us again. So here's Kenneth uh, signing off from TWTM. Good night. Yes, dedication.